Luke chapter 18 tonight, Luke chapter 18, verses 31 to 43. We're looking at the topic tonight, blind sight. Blind sight. Look tonight at the blind man that the Lord Jesus heals. And this man was blind, but he had blind sight. He could see what the crowd could not see. We're going to look at that tonight. And so, son of man, son of man is a much used term for Jesus in the New Testament. 82 times we read son of man in the Gospels. And this is a name that Jesus gave to himself. Let us pray and we'll jump in here tonight. Father, we thank you tonight for uh, all the things that we uh, just uh, testified about. And uh, Lord, thank you, Lord Jesus, for uh, souls that were saved. Thank you, Lord, for a commercial. We can still have it on television that gives the gospel and opens up the door for people to come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. So we ask that, that that's just going to happen thousands and tens of thousands of times. And we just ask that uh, you would bless the word of God as it goes forth everywhere. And uh, Father, we ask that you might empower, enable, and strengthen us to be uh, one of those instruments in your hand to share the good news of the gospel with the people around us. We ask tonight that you would help us to see uh, some neat truth from this man who was blind and received his sight, but not just his physical sight, but his spiritual sight as well. So Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to fill me now for the message. I trust and depend in you for that, uh, to lead us here tonight in this message. And we ask this in the powerful name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. We'll look at verses 31 to 34 as we get started in our text tonight. Uh, Luke chapter 18, verses 31 to 34, by way of our introduction. Then he took unto him the twelve... And said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. Now Jesus has been pushing to get to Jerusalem for a while now. And all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. And they shall scourge him and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. Notice these words, and they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. So Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, uh, holds the key here. Why did Jesus call himself the Son of Man? In Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, it reads, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Well, we all know that's the Lord Jesus Christ right there. And he took uh, this scripture and this text, and he applied that name to himself, for indeed that was him. He is the Son of Man. God, the Ancient of Days, gives to another divine being, one like the Son of Man, glory, sovereignty, worship, and everlasting dominion and eternal kingdom. And we're going to be there and enjoy that kingdom forever and ever. So Jesus, when he came to full messianic consciousness, said in effect, I am the son of man. I am the eternal sovereign king. I remember uh, 
oh, it's probably longer than I think, but probably a year ago or so, there was a young lady on the corner at the square, and she had a sign, Jesus Christ is King. And she would hold that up, and she would yell it. And I saw this, and I went around the corner, and I went and parked the car, and I got out, and I went and talked to her. I want to know what was going on here. And uh, she had been saved, and she was in a tent revival down south somewhere. And uh, she was just impressed to do that. I haven't seen her in a long, long time, but uh, she was out there. Jesus Christ is king. Well, Jesus Christ is king. And we need to remember that. He is king of kings and lord of lords. And Jesus himself is responsible for the high Christology of the New Testament. First using the term son of man for himself at the healing of the paralytic in Capernaum. First time he does that. And that happens in Mark chapter 2 verses 10 and 11. But that ye may know that the son of man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. But that ye may know that the Son of Man has power. The Son of Man, speaking of himself. He thus indicated that he was consciously and creatively investing the title with deep Christological meaning. Because this, of course, is coming from his Father, who is in heaven. Often, instead of saying, I, he said, Son of Man. I am the Son of Man. And he did this especially when he was with his disciples. They heard that term many, many times. As we said, 82 times it comes up in the Gospel. Who knows how many times the disciples heard him say that. We also know that Jesus regularly spoke of his coming death. And again, these disciples, as we read, they, they just did not get it. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 22, uh, Jesus says, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. In verse 44 of Luke 9, let these sayings sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. Now right there should give you some uh, energetic faith to know that what Jesus said happened exactly as he said it would happen. Now in tonight's text, Jesus could not have been more clear. The disciples did not get it. Why not? Their minds had no room for a suffering, dying Savior. That was just not in their thinking at all. No, no suffering, dying Messiah. The idea was theologically beyond their grasp. Only history and Christ himself would open their eyes, as Luke will record it in chapter 24. Sometimes we also, we just have to pray, Lord, open the eyes of my heart. Ephesians 1.18. The account tonight stands in dramatic contrast with the incomprehension of the disciples. We will see a blind man's faith, and it is a treasure for all who would see. So our first point tonight is simply the blind man. The blind man, looking at verses 35 to 37. And it came to pass that as he was come nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. Well, you know, he got all excited 
about that. So here's the Lord Jesus, and he's heading to uh, Jericho right now. The ultimate goal is getting to Jerusalem. And so he's walking and he is teaching. And he comes upon a blind man sitting by the way. Probably a lot of, of beggars are there along the way outside the city of Jericho. There's always a crowd around the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's going to be a much bigger crowd around him than any other rabbi who is passing by with his group that he is teaching at the time. Sometimes in the crowd there would be opposition to what the rabbi is saying, and that's normal. It was normal. Almost everyone has heard about Jesus, and they wanted to see him. So this day began like any other day. This blind man got up, and he made his way to uh, the spot of earth where he would sit, and he would beg and look for something to eat right outside of Jericho. <clears throat> So Jesus coming down the road gave the blind man something to focus on, gave him something to hear. This is bigger. This is a bigger crowd. Remember that blind people, their other senses are greatly enhanced. They, they can hear a whole lot better. They pick everything up. And so there he is. He's sitting by the wayside and people are coming and people are going and and people are, are, have their animals laden with the wares that they're going to sell. And their little animals are, are clumping down the road. <clears throat> and he's taking all of this in. And then suddenly he hears this really big crowd coming. This is a big crowd. And he asks them, what's going on? And they tell him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Well... He's heard about Jesus before. He's heard the first-hand accounts about Jesus. He's heard about the miracles. He's heard about the great healings of the Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps he has even heard that Jesus called himself the Son of Man. That he had the right bloodline. That he was from the tribe of Judah. So with, with amazing blind sight the beggar came to the conclusion that this Jesus must be the Messiah. This must be the Messiah. And so he's sitting there. His heart begins to pound. And Jesus is soon going to be passing by me. I need to do something. This is my grand opportunity. That brings us to uh, the second point, the blind man's plea. The blind man's plea in verses 38 and 39. And he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. <clears throat> now, he said this over and over. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before rebuked him, that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more, thou son of David, have mercy on me. He wasn't going to listen to this crowd. This is my opportunity right here. So he couldn't just get up and, and run and run through. the. He couldn't see where he was going. He couldn't just get his way to Jesus. And so he yells. He's yelling. Over and over, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And the people try to shush him up. Be quiet, stop that. So what does he do? He keeps yelling. He yells all the more, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. So now let's turn down the volume of this crowd for a moment and reflect on what was implicit in this man's conduct. We see why he, his cries got him everything. He got everything. He was, he was full of blind sight. Point A, so point A, blind sight about his condition. The man knew he was blind and was in perpetual physical darkness. He may have been blind from birth. We're not sure on that. He may have never seen a tree waving in the wind. He may never have seen any flowers, never seen a sunset or a sunrise or anything else that we all see. 
There's no hope for him other than a divine miracle. He needs a divine miracle. And there is only one thing worse than blindness, and that is not knowing that you're blind, which is the majority of the world. That's a scary thought. The majority of the world is blind spiritually. They, they cannot see. Million, billions of people are blind to their darkness, blind to their sin, blind to their destiny, blind to their hopelessness, spiritually in the dark. Human reasoning says that every time a person sins, he or she will see more and more of his or her sin. That is not the way it is. It is the opposite. The opposite is true. Every time a man sins, he makes himself more blind, less capable of realizing what sin is, less likely of realizing that he is a sinner. Just go to your high school class reunion, you'll find that out. These, they, they get blinder every time you, you would think, okay, they're five years older, won't they sort of wake up and see, hey, you know what, maybe I should do something about my spiritual condition. No. It's, it's blinder and blinder. More booze. More drinks. For unforgiven sinners, darkness and light are the same. Their blindness makes it impossible to see. What a grace it is to be able to see reality. When we see what we are, when we are surrounded by darkness and know it, we will begin to search for the light. And there are those kinds of people. They get it. So we have this blind man and he has a pitiful cry, have mercy on me. This is coming from a profound self-understanding and it brought grace into his soul. Christ rejoices to engage people in that reality. B, blind sight about Jesus. The blind man voiced penetrating insight as to who Jesus was, who he is, as he kept repeating, much to everyone's distress, Son of David, have mercy on me. That was, what was that? That was a blatant messianic assertion. Yeah, I believe this Jesus passing by, he is the Messiah. This is the only assertion like that in the whole Gospel of Luke only one. This blind man believed Jesus was the Messiah, and he was shouting it. Son of David, have mercy on me. Someone once asked blind Helen Keller, isn't it terrible to be blind? Why would you say that to some? I just, that troubles me. <laughs> But well, she gave him an answer. She said, better to be blind and see with your heart than to have two good eyes and see nothing. That's what's going on in our text. That's what's happening with this blind man. No, he couldn't look around and see like we see, but he could see with his heart. He could see with his heart. And you know, sometimes blindness has its Benefits. Benefits. The blind man had an exalted view of Jesus Christ, realizing his own darkness and his need of Jesus Christ. C, blind-sighted persistence. Blind-sighted persistence. We see the man's passionate persistence. He was not giving up. <laughs> he was not. He rejected the crowd's shushing and shouted all the more. You know, as believers, we need to do that too. We need to shout all the more. Uh, we don't listen to the crowd. We don't let them shush you up. This man was coming to Jesus as a small child, helpless and dependent. We've been pressing that one 
in our study of Luke every week almost. Helpless and dependent. That's the only way you can come. And the blind man's strong sense of urgency reveals what should be in every single soul on the planet. Helplessness and dependence. Spiritual blessings belong to those who go for it. Go for it. Jeremiah 29, 13. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I submit to you tonight that every person who is truly walking close to the Lord, that is in their heart. They are seeking for righteousness. They are seeking for the truth. They are wanting to live for God. They are wanting to go above and beyond all the, the liberal, quote, Christians that are out there. This blind man shows us beautifully that spiritual blessings do not go to the half-hearted, but to those who want them above all else. That's what this blind man was after. He was going for it. Helpless as he was, the blind man went for it, and God heard him. Point number three, Jesus' response, 40 to 43, verses 40 to 43. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought. Just be quiet. And Jesus heard the man, bring him to me. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What wilt thou that I shall do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight, thy faith hath Save thee. Now what happens after? And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise unto God. It's, it's always neat to see how Jesus flipped the situations. Oh, be quiet. Oh, hush up. What does he do? Bring the children here. <laughs> Bring the blind man here. We're not, we're not going for this stuff that the crowd wants. Not doing that. So Jesus had a response. And here he is. He's pushing to get to Jerusalem. But what does he do? He stops for this blind man. Doesn't keep going. He doesn't put his cries out of his ears. He stops. He stops and says, Bring him over here. So what did the crowd do? All right, let's go. Come on. <laughs> he wants, Jesus wants to see you. We're going to take you over there. He gets on his feet with the help of others, and he gets to Jesus. Can you imagine how happy this guy was? This must have been something to be there. Can't wait to see the video. He gets on his feet and he goes to Jesus. Wow. Jesus wants this blind man to be able to articulate what's in his heart. And that's what he, exactly what he did. He brought him over and Jesus is going to strengthen the man's faith. This man knew exactly what he wanted. Exactly. When we know our needs and can articulate them in prayer, what blessings follow? That's what happens in this text in verses 42 and 43 that we read. The blind beggar was blind at the beginning of Jesus' sentence and could see at the end of it. That quick. It was quick. I love that. No surgery. Just like that, he could see. There are scholars that speak about this blind man. They say he is Bartimaeus in Mark 10, 46. They also say he became a strong leader in the church. Now, we read tonight that he followed the Lord. 
He's healed, and he follows the Lord Jesus. How long do you think he followed him? I'm going to guess that he followed him all the way to the cross. I mean, you get your sight, you're not going to stop following. I mean, this is, I mean, I can't imagine what that would be like to not be able to see anything, and all of a sudden the whole world is opened up to you. And it says he followed after the Lord Jesus. And as he follows the Lord Jesus, that's what you call getting an eyeful. That's called getting an eyeful. What do we want to learn from the blind sight of this man? Well, first, we must see our own need. We have to see our own need. We, we have to see the sin that is numbing our eyes to what Christ is asking of us. We have to be able to see our need. Second, after we see our need, we need to see who Jesus is. And I think we've been able to see a little bit of what Jesus is tonight as we have looked at the story of the blind man. And then third, we need to do the same thing. We need to cry out too. Jesus, now son of David, have mercy on me. It's, this is a quick one, two, three. You know, salvation is not one, two, three, repeat after me. But this is simply one, two, three. See your need, see Jesus, and call out to him. It is that easy. I hope that we're doing that on a daily basis. Let us pray. Father, we thank you tonight for this great account of this blind man. What a day it had to be for him. Getting up in the morning and not knowing exactly what was going to happen that day, and yet it became the greatest day of his life because Jesus came by. Father, we ask tonight that uh, we ourselves will see Jesus coming by every day. As we look at him, help us to see who he is, to see our need, and to cry out for help. Father, we ask that we would be just like this man, Bartimaeus, in our life, and follow hard after you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.